Hey, yo. Um, I look at science articles online and I try to find, you know, where all the mistakes are. And one really big mistake that they keep on repeating over and over again when it's outdated even by their own terms is on sciencenews.org. The recipes for solar system formation are getting a rewrite. They're, they're not getting a rewrite, they're just saying that in the article. And I'll show you they're not even rewriting things even with the data that they are collecting. So they're not even updating the stuff that they already know about. This is it's just it's weirder and weirder and weirder. I, I can't imagine how we've progressed at all. And you know, to think about it, seeing how hard it is for even modern science to progress, no wonder for the past like 2,000 years we've <laughs> been doing the equivalent of you know, bashing rocks together. It's because this stuff takes a long time to change even when we do have all the information, even when we do have all the satellites, even when we do have all the money and the resources in the world, it still takes forever to change. And this is this is proof right here. Anyways, uh, page 9 of 15. I'll link this stuff to the bottom. Uh, this is on the recipes for solar system formation or getting rewrite. The most popular planet detection strategies each measure one of those factors. The transit method, method used by the Kepler Space Telescope Watches a star wink as the as the planet passes in front. There's the first mistake. Stars and planets are the same things. Comparing the star's light before and after the transit reveals the planet's size, the older star and the younger star. The radio velocity method used with telescopes on the ground watches the star wobble in response to the older star's gravity. They put planets here. Which reveals the planet's mass. Again, this is simple shit here. Most of the stars observed by Kepler are too far away and too dim for direct accurate measurements of their host star's masses, but astronomers for their companion's masses, but astronomers have inferred have inferred a size cutoff for rocky planets, and this is what I'm going into. Last June, researchers analyzing the full Kepler dataset noticed a surprising lack of planets between 1.5 and 2 times Earth's size and suggested those 1.5 times Earth radius or smaller are probably rocky, 2 to 3.5 times Earth radius are probably gassy. Did you get that? A surprising lack of planets between 1.5 and 2 times Earth's size. They're talking about the radius, not the mass, just the radius. So, we're clear. 1.5 Earth radius and 2 radius, right there. And they're saying that there's a surprising lack, there's no objects in the center right there. But if you go to exoplanet.eu and you look up the data set of all the exoplanets discovered between 1.5 and 2 Earth radii, you'll find that there are 453 of them. 453 is their definition of a surprising lack of planets. Again, this was written, uh, this most, this uh, article right here was written basically today or yesterday, whenever. And the article that is being linked here was written in June 19th, 2017. Kepler shows small exoplanets are either super-Earths or mini-Neptunes. And this is coming from the researchers themselves. This isn't just, you know, they find something and then the magazine editors skew the information. This is directly from the horse's mouth. Careful measurements of the candidate stars... Oh yeah, this is the, uh, this is the other article written in June 17th or June 19, 2017, last year. Careful measurements of the candidate stars revealed a surprising gap between planets about 1.5 and 2 times the size of Earth. 
Benjamin Fulton of the University of Hawaii at Manoa and Caltech and his colleagues found. There are a few planets in the gap, but most straddle it. A few planets in the gap. 453 planets, as they phrase it, are a few. I don't think so. What's happening here is they want their theories to work. They're trying to look for patterns in the sizes of them because to them, planets do not evolve. They are formed as is. Their size stops after they start, after they finished forming and then they stay like that size forever. They don't evolve. They don't lose their mass and they don't become other types of planets. In stellar metamorphosis, it's actually fixed. The planets do evolve. Their sizes do change. As they lose mass, they cool, shrink, and solidify. And we know this because we have observations of literally tens of thousands of objects doing this. It's going to be into the millions. And when the test goes up, the transiting exoplanet survey satellite, when that goes up, they're going to find tens of thousands of them even addition to it. And that little box right there, as you can see, is where their gap is. There is no gap. There are going to be hundreds of thousands of objects discovered in there over the next couple years. And we shall see that in the future. I just wanted to point this out, this out to you guys because it was just surprising that even with their own information, with all the billions and billions of dollars that they get for funding, with all the powerful connections and politics that they engage in, they can't correct one simple thing in that there's no gap between 2 and 1.5 Earth radii. There is no gap. In fact, it's actually predicted that shit... To me, it looks like the majority of the ocean world slash Earth type objects are going to be right inside that gap. Gap. But at least the ones that host life, that is. So it's just really weird. And it's going to be interesting watching all this get corrected in the future. And they're going to pretend it never happened, as they usually do when they're wrong. It's funny, scientists are, oh yeah, we're cool with being wrong. Yet when they are wrong, they don't ever talk about it. They cover it up, Shh, it never happened. Alright you guys, take it easy.